I know and you know he's able. The question is, is he willing? And we, we know that our father will not withhold any good gifts from us. Why don't you just rush to that chat this morning and say, I'm expecting a miracle. If you have no expectations from God, maybe that's why he's not doing anything for you. You ought to ask because the scripture says, if you, you have not because you ask not, ask for the unreasonable, as for the unsearchable, as for what eyes cannot see and ears have not heard, ask God to do something amazing with you and through you that you can record a historical moment in the life, in your life as you walk with Jesus Christ. Preaching text, St. John chapter 12, I'm reading from the NIV translation. I'm reading from, I'm expecting a miracle this morning. I'm reading from the NIV translation beginning at verse 12. It says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming. Listen to what it says. Your king is coming. That ought to shout you right there. Your king is coming. I want to say it one more time. Your king is coming. But look how he's coming. He seated, he seated on a donkey's coat. He's seated on a donkey. He's coming, but he's not coming the way you think he is coming. Oh, but at first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize. Look what verse 15 says. Do not be afraid, daughters of Zion, See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. For a few minutes, my brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and the aid of the Holy Spirit, I want to talk about how to celebrate the king, how to celebrate and write over somewhere, say how to respond to the king. For I would encourage you, my brothers and sisters, that in your time of devotion and your intimacy with God, that you would read verses 12 through 19 that make up the context of our text. It is in chapter 11 that we know the story about about Jesus calling Lazarus from the grave. Jesus rescues Lazarus from the grave in chapter 11. But at the beginning of chapter 12, the Bible says that Jesus is being celebrated. They are giving him a dinner in honor of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, Jesus is anointed as the king of the Jews. But now in verses 12 through 15, he's finally announced as the king. Can I tell you something, my brothers and sisters? It is my prayer this morning that you and I, that not only would Jesus be our father, but he needs to be our king. He's anointed king 
king, and then he's announced as king. This is the first time that the children or the Jews have announced that Jesus is king. It's in verse 12 that they give Jesus a parade. They heard that Jesus was coming. A crowd showed up in what we call Palm Sunday, and they took palm branches and went out to meet him. There is the parade in verse 12, and then there's praise in verse 13. They're saying, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Notice there's a parade for the king, and then there's praise for the king. But then there's prophecy in verses 14 through 16, long before Jesus came into this scene, it had already been announced of how he would come. And here, my brothers and sisters, please pay special attention that they said the king is coming. The king of Israel will come. He will come, but look how he comes. Notice there is the prophecy, there is the praise, there is the parade, but then in verse 17 through 18, there is some popularity. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. That's how you know you're popular. They spread the word. What did they spread the word about? That Jesus had called Lazarus from the dead, and we've recognized that he is our king. That's my, that's my prayer, that you would recognize that Jesus is a king. He's just not any king, but he is king of kings, and he is Lord of lords. And he deserves to be celebrated. He deserves to be honored. He deserves to be worshiped on this Palm Sunday. There's the parade in verse 12. There's the praise in verse 13. There's the prophecy in verses 14 through 16. There's the popularity in verses 17 through 18. But watch this. Popularity leads to protest. Here's what God has taught me. And if it happened to Jesus, it'll happen to you. And just because you become popular in some people's eyes don't mean you'll still be trash in other people's eyes. There's the popularity and there's the protest. Er, let me pause this message for a second and give you some insight and some information. You ought to be glad that you're not popular with everybody because if you were popular with everybody, that means you would be jumping through hoops. That means you would be doing things for people just to be around you when they really don't like you. You need some negative people in your life. You need some haters in your life. You need some lemons with no sugar in your life. You need a cross in your life. You need some crucifixion in in your life. It, it's the reason why you need negativity in your life, because if you pay attention to some things, it don't work without a negative post and a positive post. The car won't run without a negative post. Uh, uh, the batteries won't operate in, 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 in the in this computer without a negative post. And guess what? You and I won't work right, won't grow right, won't praise right, won't worship right if we don't have some negativity in our lives. You ought to pause right now and thank God in the chat and tell him, thank you for some negativity. I wouldn't have been close to you without negativity. I wouldn't know you without some negativity. It says, when my father and my mother forsake me, 
you're still there for me. Thank you for some negativity. Here's what the text is tailored to teach us this morning, that at some point, the people recognize Jesus as the king. Isn't it strange that the people recognize Jesus as the king, but in verses 16, that the disciples didn't recognize who he was? How in the world can you walk with them? How in the world can you hang out with a king and don't know he is a king? Well, maybe my brothers and sisters, you and I don't recognize who Jesus is, not because of what he's doing, but because we're used to judging a book by its cover. It's hard to see a king who's not lifted high. It's hard to see a king who's not riding on a horse. It's hard to see a king who does not have pageantry and does not have people before him and people after him. This king is hard to recognize because he's riding on a donkey. This king is hard to recognize because even the donkey is too small for Jesus to watch this, to ride on. Historians suggest that while Jesus is riding on the coat of an ass, Jesus' feet is dragging in the dust. This coat does not even have the ability to lift Jesus up. Jesus got to hold his own legs up. Jesus has to depend on something to carry him, but he's really carrying it. It's hard to recognize God when you're checking things out from the outside, but you ought to check the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not based on what he looks like, but based on what he acts like. And the last time we checked, he is a loving king. He is a worthy king. He is a king of character. He is a king of holiness. Do anybody know who the king is? What's his name? Jesus. And here they recognize Jesus and then they respond to Jesus. Hey, before you can celebrate him, you've got to know him. And when you know him, you'll respond to him. And there's three things that I see in this text that you and I ought to take at least one of them and respond correctly. Well, pastor, what do you see on this Palm Sunday that lets us know that Jesus is king and that we ought to respond to him appropriately? Well, look right there. There's the key word in the text. It says in verse 13, they call out the name Hosanna. Many of you, my brothers and sisters, if you were asked the question, what does Hosanna mean? You and I would probably say it means to praise Jesus. But when you check out the word Hosanna in its original context, it does not mean to praise Jesus. It means save us now. And when you recognize that Jesus is king, you'll not just be praising him, but you'll be praying to him. That's what it is, my brothers and sisters. When you find out the king and you're living in his kingdom, it is your and my responsibility to Ask Jesus to save us now. Here's what I love about this text. The king is understood as someone who can take care of his kingdom. And why would you be a part of a king's kingdom who can't take care of the people in the kingdom? The Israelites, the Jews yells out, save us now. Watch this, watch this. They praise, but they praise pray first, because it's, this is what they were saying. This is what they were saying. Help us right now. And I've got some individuals on this virtual service that need the king to help us right now. Help us right now with this pandemic. Help us right now with this COVID virus. Help us right now with this vaccination. Help us right now in the midst of this response session. Help us right now. Here's the problem with the prayer, my brothers and sisters. These individuals were praying for 
temporary help. When Jesus comes to solve not temporary problems, he comes with permanent solutions. I love this, my brothers and sisters, because I don't need Jesus to help me with troubles that don't last always. I need Jesus to help me out with permanent solutions. Is there anybody in here that wants some permanent peace, some permanent joy, some permanent praise, some permanent character, something permanent permanent that does not leave us. I want to wake up godly and I want to go to bed godly. I want to wake up with peace and I want to lay down with some peace. And here's the problem. They're praying to the king because they say Hosanna, but they're asking for him to solve temporary problems. Jesus says, I didn't come to deal with your outside. I came to deal with your inside. The problem is not what people are doing to you. The problem is what is in you. I didn't come to overthrow the Roman government. I didn't come to give everybody a car. I didn't come to give everybody millions, but I did come to cleanse your heart. I want to give you a heart that works right, a heart that thinks right, a heart that's pure, a heart that's holy. Is there anybody in here says that, Lord, I'm going to stop asking you to deal with my habits, and I'm going to ask you to deal with my heart. My heart is deceitfully wicked. My heart ain't right. My heart holds grudges. My heart is not happy. But if you just search my heart and know my thoughts, if there's anything that's not right, is there anybody in this virtual service that Search my heart. They pray, but they're praying for temporary problems when Jesus says, I've come to give you permanent solutions. Not only should you respond and pray the right way, it says, but not only, he says, pray. They pray to the king. Save us now, but don't start on the outside. Start on the inside. I see you, Crystal Joyner. Thank you for raising those hands up. And it ought to be more of us raising hands because have you ever discovered that you get all you want, but your heart still don't know how to handle it? Not only did they pray, but notice how they responded. The text says there's another key word. The first one is Hosanna. The second one is fear not. Wait a minute. It says in verse 15, do not be afraid. It is a positive command that God or Jesus is giving to his followers to guess what? Stop being afraid and trust me. They say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, how am I going to stop being afraid? Because look what it says. Your king is coming. Wait a minute. What is it saying? Help is on the way. Okay. He may not come when you want him to come, but he's on his way to deal with your dilemma. If that does not cause you to trust Christ, then here's another one. I promise you he's coming. But here's the good news. He's coming on a donkey. I know why you can't get excited. Because you don't know what donkeys represent and symbolize in the Bible. Well, one Come here, let's go to Genesis. When our beloved Jacob, the trickster and the liar had to go back home at the command of God to go back home to his father's land, Jacob knew hey, he had to go through his enemy. 
and he had to go through Esau. History repeats itself. What does Jacob do? Jacob takes a bunch of donkeys, set gifts on the donkeys, and sends them to his brother Esau to make peace with his enemies. Y'all didn't shout yet. That's because you don't know your Bible like you should. You ought to read it every now and then. Mm, oh, taste and see that the word of God and the Lord is good and you'll bless his name. Look what the scripture suggests. It suggests that this symbol or this donkey that Jacob used put gifts on it to get through his enemies. And that's my word for you. When you see Jesus, the gift from God, riding on a donkey from God, he's coming to deal with your enemies and my enemies. But he didn't came to deal with your boss. He didn't come to deal with your husband. He came to deal with the real enemy, the one that seeks to destroy, the one that is is conniving. He's called a snake. He was the bright and morning star. His name was Lucifer. And aren't you glad, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus knows who to deal with to bring you peace. He destroys the enemy. He defeats the devil. He snatches the keys from him. He delivers the keys in the kingdom to us. And you ought to be thankful today that when you see the gift of God riding on the donkey. He's coming to deal with our enemies. But guess what else he's doing on that donkey? He's riding on a coat who's never been written before. Not only is it a sign of peace, but it's a sign that I've got this thing under control. And that's my word to somebody. You can trust him because he's going to bring you peace. You can trust him because he's got everything under control. And can I tell you something? Here is the good news. This donkey had never been broken before. This donkey had never been ridden before, but yet Jesus gets on him and controls him and rides him and keeps him from getting out of control. And that's what I love about Jesus. When I can't keep myself under control, Jesus comes in and the King of King and the Lord of Lords takes away my fears. He brings me peace. He lets me know that even though it's out of control, I got it under control because I am Lord. And if that don't make you shout this morning, and if that don't wipe away your fears, then you ought to be shame of yourself. But here's the good news. Jesus says, I've got it under control, but just in case this coat does not act right, I brought a friend along with him to help me keep him under control because not only was Jesus riding on the coat, but he brought the mother of the coat with him to keep him under control. Good news, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus works and the Holy Spirit works. And when you don't know how you're going to get through the Holy Spirit will come alongside of you and will encourage you and will strengthen you and tell you fear not. I'm out of here. You know it. The proper response to the king before we celebrate the king, we got to pray to the king, pray for an inside job and not an outside job. And then we've got to trust the king and we're going to trust the king because we see him what the king can do. The king can heal. The king can deliver. The king can set the captives free. And all you got to do is call on the name of the king. Do anybody know who the king is? What's his name? Jesus. Here's all I'm saying that once you pray to the king and once you trust the king, here's the next step. Look what it says. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming because you're going to pray to the king and you're going to trust the king. 
but you're going to let go of some things for the king. That's what I'm here to tell all 40 some of us on this virtual service, let it go. Well, what did they let go that we need to let go? Look, 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 Reverend Grace, Reverend Grace, Reverend Grace, your pastor study, your pastor study, Mike Johnson, your pastor study. Look what happens, I'm coming. Look what it says, the king is coming, but look how he's coming. Remember, when a king entered into a city, when he entered into his triumphal entry, he's never before came low. He always came high. He had the highest chariot. He had the highest horse. He sat high because he wanted people to know that he was better than those up under him. Notice what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't come lifted up high because that's your and my job to lift him up high. Preach, Cersei. It ain't the responsibility of a horse to lift up Jesus. It's the responsibility of those in the parade to lift up Jesus. Y'all missed y'all chance to shout. Are you going to let a horse talk better? about Jesus than you can? Are you going to let a chariot lift him up? No, you're going to lift him up with your voice and you ought to shout right now that he is king of kings and he is lord of lords. And just because he's riding low on a donkey don't mean you ought not lift him up with your voice. Look what they let go. Not only did they let go and let God use their voices, but they let go, catch this, they let go of their false expectations of who Jesus is. They finally understand that, watch this, we didn't want him to come like that. This is the way we wanted him to come. But they finally caught on that Jesus wasn't coming the way they wanted him to come. Jesus came the way they needed him to come. Uh-oh, stop, rewind. Why is it, beloved, that you can praise him when he does what you need, but yet, you start grumbling and we start complaining when he stops giving us what we need and start giving us what he wants us to have. Can I tell you something? Every now and then, God doesn't give you what you want. God always gives you what you need. And sometimes what you need ain't what you want, and you mumble, grumble, and complain. You don't need no more gifts. You need some growth. You don't need no more gifts. You need some grace. You don't need no more gifts. You need a heart transplant. Plan. And every now and then, when God sees what you need, he doesn't add, he takes away. Do I have a witness in this place? You grow because he took away. You prayed because he took away. He didn't give you what you wanted. He gave you what you needed. And Jesus says, you don't need a king high and lifted up. You need a king who is low, but yet he's powerful. I've got some good news for somebody today. You and I need to recognize that Jesus oftentimes does not come through the front door. Jesus does not all the time come through a relative, but sometimes Jesus comes through an enemy. Sometimes Jesus allows the enemy to attack our relationships. Sometimes he allows them to attack our finances. Sometimes he allows them to attack our health. But here's the good news. Whatever Jesus allows today is going to be a better outcome outcome tomorrow. And do I have a witness in this place? Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, but how do we know things are going to be better? Because we ain't going to quit. 
And the scripture says that trouble don't last always. In this walk and in this Palm Sunday, I am going to rejoice, not just when he gives me what he, what I want. I'm going to rejoice when he gives me what I need. Sometimes I need discipline. Sometimes I need to hear no. Sometimes I need to be chastened. Sometimes I need to go down. Sometimes I need to be sat down. Sometimes I need to be flat on my back. But if Jesus Christ allowed it to happen, Jesus Christ can turn it around. And on this Palm Sunday, it's time for us to celebrate, not celebrate what we want, celebrate what we need. And we need a house not made by hands. We need a home that is in heaven. We need sunshine on a cloudy day. We need blessing. We need your word. We need your holiness. But catch this. This is how we shut this thing down. Look what it shows. On Friday, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and he was being praised. He went from palms Watch this. He went from palms. He went from palms on Friday to thorns on the next Friday. It took all the seven days for these individuals to turn on him. What do you, what do you mean, Pastor? They turned on him. They were praising him on one Friday, and then the following Friday, they were crucifying him. Well, what's the difference? Why did they praise him? Why did they praise him on one Friday, and why did they crucify him on the next Friday? Can I tell you something? On this Friday, they thought he was giving them what they want. But on the following Friday, he was giving them what they need. And here's the problem. They got mad when he didn't give them what they want, and he gave them what they need. Good night, my brothers and sisters. May the Lord bless you real good on this Palm Sunday. But if you've got any kind of praise in you, you ought to ask God to give you consistent praise. And I know the crucifixion crucifixion is not what you wanted, but the crucifixion is what you needed. You needed his blood. You needed his forgiveness. You needed him to defeat the enemy. You needed him to defeat the grave. You needed him to rise on Sunday morning. You needed him to ascend to the right hand of the Father, and you need him to come back again. And here's my word to you. If the Lord never done it, anything else for you. He's already done enough. He died. He rose and he lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I can love my enemies. Because he lives, he lives and he lives in me. How to respond? Take some time out to reflect. Are you praying to the king to deal with the outside or are you praying with the king to deal with the inside? Are you fearful, not realizing that Jesus is the prince of peace and that he's coming, but he's just not coming the way you want him to come? Here's it. Sometimes Jesus divides in order to add, and sometimes he subtracts in order to multiply. But he's coming. But the good news is he's not coming the way you want him to come. And don't get angry, because when he comes, he's not just going to give you what you want. On this Palm Sunday, I pray and ask God to give us what we need. You have just heard the word of God through Pastor Michael A. Searcy at New Direction Worship Center. May God bless you and may God keep you.